Much like carbon, nitrogen follows a basic pathway in a continuous cycle. This cycle is critical to all living organisms that have existed or will exist on the planet. Wastewater treatment plants play a critical role in reintroducing nitrogen back into this cycle with limited environmental impact. High levels of nitrogen entering natural waterways can result in toxic conditions for wildlife, dissolved oxygen depletion, and excessive algae growth, all harmful to local plant, animal, and human populations. Nitrogen enters wastewater through various pathways. The most abundant contributor of nitrogen in typical municipal wastewater is urea. Yeah, urine. Other contributors of nitrogen are food processing waste, chemical cleaning agents, and many other industrial components. Nitrogen is present in wastewater in various forms, which have been lumped into separate general categories. Nitrogen, in the form of ammonia, is ammonia nitrogen. There is also nitrite nitrogen and nitrate nitrogen, which are usually formed during the actual biological processes at the wastewater treatment plant. In addition to these forms, nitrogen makes up a small percentage of the cell mass of the organisms in the system, as well as other dissolved organic compounds. This category is referred to as organic nitrogen of which a certain amount typically cannot be removed through the biological processes that will be described in this video. Total nitrogen, as the name implies, is the sum of all types of nitrogen. TKN, or total Kaldal nitrogen, named after the scientist Johann Kaldal, is the sum of only organic nitrogen and ammonia nitrogen. TIN, or total inorganic nitrogen, is just as the name implies, the total nitrogen minus the organic nitrogen. In simplistic terms, nitrogen in various forms is flushed, rinsed, or otherwise introduced into the sewer system. Almost all of this organic nitrogen, urea for example, is immediately hydrolyzed into ammonia. In water, gaseous ammonia, NH3, is almost entirely converted to ionized ammonia, or ammonium, NH4+. Specialized autotrophic bacteria, or nitrifiers, convert the ammonium to nitrite, NO2, and then to nitrate, NO3 through various biological processes. As dissolved oxygen is depleted by the nitrifiers and other organisms in the basin, other specialized heterotrophic bacteria, denitrifiers, are able to thrive by using the oxygen attached to the nitrate molecules for respiration, creating nitrogen gas as a byproduct. The nitrogen gas then simply bubbles out of the water into the atmosphere. Pretty slick, right? Well, let's go back to the beginning and take a closer look at each of these important steps in the nitrogen removal process. First, as a natural reaction in an aqueous solution, or in water, the vast majority of the organic nitrogen immediately hydrolyzes into ammonia. Most of this ammonia automatically converts to the ionic form ammonium. The equilibrium between the gaseous and ionic forms of ammonia is heavily impacted by the pH of the water. A more acidic solution will favor the ionic form, ammonium. A more basic will favor the gaseous form, ammonia. Since wastewater typically ranges between a pH of 6 and 9, almost all of the ammonia will be in the ionic form. Since ammonia testing accounts for both forms, ionic and gaseous, it is not necessary to worry about each form separately. No bacteria is necessary for this conversion, it just happens. The next step in the process consists of converting ammonium to nitrite and then nitrate. This two-step process is usually lumped into one term, nitrification. This step is facilitated by a specialized autotrophic bacteria. So what does autotrophic mean? There are two broad categories for how organisms obtain carbon required for growth, autotrophs and heterotrophs. Autotrophs are able to obtain their carbon from non-organic sources such as carbon dioxide and the alkaline bicarbonate. Plants are good examples of how this is done. Heterotrophs, on the other hand, require organic sources of carbon. Essentially, heterotrophs get carbon by consuming other organic compounds, humans and animals being good examples. In contrast to heterotrophic BOD-consuming bacteria, autotrophic nitrifiers require more time to mature and maintain their population in a biological wastewater treatment system. The nitrifiers dictate the SRT in nitrogen-reducing plants. How fast nitrifiers grow depends on the temperature of the wastewater and the amount of dissolved oxygen present. If nitrifiers aren't allowed enough time to thrive, you run the risk of accidentally wasting them out of the system entirely and losing nitrification. Higher temperatures and DO concentrations means faster growth. Colder temperatures and lower DO concentrations means slower growth. Also, when no DO is present, nitrifiers can become completely inactive. 
As a note, it is important to remember that nitrifiers are also quite sensitive to pH, tending to function most comfortably in water with a pH between 6.8 and 7.5. Once a healthy population of nitrifiers has developed in your system, the first step, performed largely by a group of bugs known as ammonia oxidizers, will take the ammonium and DO and convert it into acid, water, nitrite, and energy. If your system doesn't have adequate alkalinity, the acid produced here could create inhospitably acidic conditions for the bacteria, resulting in major process hiccups including loss of nitrification. The water produced is absorbed in the system, the nitrate moves on to the next step, and the energy is used by the bacteria to grow and multiply. The second step, for which a group of bugs known as nitrite oxidizers is largely responsible, takes that nitrite and more DO and converts it into nitrate and energy. This conversion from ammonia to nitrate is nitrification. Typically, full nitrification is observed when ammonia concentrations are reduced to less than 2 mg per liter and nitrite concentrations to less than half a milligram per liter. As mentioned, nitrification is a very oxygen hungry process. As a comparison, in order to remove one pound of BOD, 1.2 pounds of oxygen are required. However, to reduce one pound of ammonia to nitrate, 4.6 pounds of oxygen are required. Since getting dissolved oxygen into wastewater is a very energy intensive process, it would benefit every treatment plant's electrical bill if they didn't aerate more than they needed to. Over aerating does nothing to improve the process, it really is flushing money down the toilet. After nitrification, the nitrogen is still in the system, mostly as part of the bugs and in the form of nitrate. Though not as toxic as ammonia, nitrates can still contribute to eutrophication and if released into a source supplying drinking water, can endanger human populations, specifically infants, causing what is known as blue baby syndrome by interfering with blood oxygenation. The final step in completely removing nitrogen from the system is called denitrification. Since nitrification is converting ammonia to nitrate, one could think that denitrification is simply the reversal of this process. Confusingly, yet fortunately, this is not the case. Denitrification is performed by a specialized heterotrophic bacteria. These guys require some pretty specific conditions to perform this step. First of all, they need some food, or BOD. In order to oxidize that food, they need oxygen. Their easiest and first choice for oxygen is DO. If there is no DO present, however, they look to alternative sources, such as nitrate. These specialists have the ability to strip the oxygen from nitrate molecules to satisfy their needs. This critical environment where DO is not present, yet nitrates are, is referred to as anoxic, and is absolutely required for denitrification. These bugs take the BOD and nitrate to produce energy, base, and nitrogen gas. The base is actually very useful in buffering the acid produced during nitrification. The nitrogen gas then floats in tiny bubbles to the surface and into the atmosphere. Though great in the biological basin, denitrification in a clarifier can result in undesirable floating sludge. There are many alternative strategies for developing anoxic conditions. Some treatment plants are designed to have dedicated anoxic zone volumes in the flow chart while others strive to develop these anoxic zones within the oxidation ditch or aeration zone by rigidly controlling aeration or by turning off aerators for set periods of time. Additionally, under certain conditions, micro-anoxic zones can be developed within the bacterial flocks themselves, resulting in what is referred to as simultaneous nitrification denitrification. Various levels of denitrification may be required depending on the local discharge permit. However, full biological denitrification typically results in only 1 to 3 milligrams of nitrate in the effluent stream. Now, let's take a look at some real-life operational scenarios. During your routine operational sampling, you notice that the ammonia in the effluent is beginning to rise above 1 to 2 milligrams per liter. Let's think about what could be causing this. We know that nitrification is an oxygen-hungry process. Perhaps the aeration is insufficient. We also know that nitrifiers grow more slowly. Perhaps the SRT is too short due to an influence of temperature. Also we know that nitrifiers are very sensitive to changes in pH or toxic conditions. Perhaps this performance loss is due to a disturbance of that nature. Knowing these things, the possible solutions are easily determined. If low DO is the culprit, full nitrification will return by increasing aeration. If temperatures have dropped, the SRT may need to be increased to maintain a healthy nitrifying population. If pH or toxicity is the culprit, 
certain specific actions may be required depending on the exact cause. For the next problem, instead of ammonia, you notice that your effluent nitrate concentration is on the rise. What could cause this to happen? Well, we know that denitrification requires anoxic conditions be formed in the basin. Perhaps these conditions are not being allowed to develop due to over-aeration. A more unlikely yet possible cause could be lower than usual BOD in the influent. If anoxic conditions are not being allowed to develop due to too much DO, decreasing the aeration will help in restoring these special conditions. If the BOD loading is unusually low, there may not be enough carbon for the denitrifying bacteria to perform. This less likely scenario would require additional carbon be added to the influent stream. Finally, during your afternoon stroll through the plant, you notice unsightly small bits of floating sludge accumulating on the surface of the clarifier. Upon this discovery, you immediately remember this helpful video discussing this exact scenario. It becomes obvious to you that your sludge blanket at the bottom of the clarifier is going anoxic and denitrifying, causing sludge to float due to the generation of nitrogen bubbles. Letting instinct take over, you spring to action by increasing the recycle rate, thus reducing the sludge inventory time in the clarifier, preventing this unwelcome denitrification. So in summary, a wastewater treatment plant helps nitrogen through the nitrogen cycle by optimizing conditions for nitrification and denitrification. By so doing, wastewater treatment plants help minimize the human impact on our fresh waterways and environment.